Forming a fond reverence for a game you played recently seems less easy than a game you might be nostalgic for. The simpler times of childhood, playing the first few levels of a PlayStation game over and over because you don't have a memory card, and having that small part of the game permanently etched into your brain can instill an inflated respect for the game in you. Nowadays, I find this experience to be rarer, as my understanding of the machine I'm interfacing with has been fully demystified. But something about cult heretic kingdoms awakened this reverence within me. Released in 2004, Cult Heretic Kingdoms, also known as Heretic Kingdoms The Inquisition, is the first in a trilogy of action role-playing games developed by Slovakian game developer Games Farm, in partnership with iHobo, a video game consultancy organization who provided most, if not all, of the game's plot and writing. Recently, video game development has become widely accessible with tools like the Unity Engine, but during the early parts of the millennium, the process of learning to create games wasn't easy. After a short email correspondence with Games Farm CEO Peter Nagy, I learned that the studio was composed of young guys who were just out of tertiary education and decided to create a game together. Jan Turan programmed the engine and the game by himself. The existence of the game at all is miraculous. The quantity of pre-rendered environments at the quality that they are is astounding and the number of different character models is incredible. There are some less than fantastic models, but then there's the excellent ones. The gameplay is generally simplistic, but it's consistently engaging throughout the 18 hours it took for me to finish the game. There are some rough edges, of course, but I find them somewhat easy to ignore. M mostly. The game is almost entirely controlled with the mouse. Left click moves the character to the location clicked on, and right click attacks towards the mouse's current position. This leads to a similar gameplay style to microwing units in an RTS game, stuttered movements away from enemies as shots are fired with each pause. The player can create a sort of hotbar at the bottom of the screen, but there is no way to assign slots to keys. They must be clicked, which is cumbersome. Because of this, I only had my healing item selectable, and sometimes the character would walk toward the bottom of the screen, attracted to a misclick. A second hotbar is automatically populated by active attunements. Each weapon and armor piece will become attuned when equipped, and after activating the attunement at a campfire, these effects will start to trigger whenever appropriate. Some of these effects seem somewhat worthless, while others are build-defining. By the end of the game, you'll have lightning and fireballs flying everywhere whenever you shoot an arrow from your storm bow, which makes a battlefield very chaotic. The role-playing aspect is rather light. While the player is capable of making choices in conversation, the majority of the choices revolve around how specific scenarios play out. Which thief prince will you kill, clear a cave of slavers, or inform them of an escaped slave, cause the narrative to cycle back on itself and become the villain? The player will always reach the same story beats, the decisions just determine who you're going to be fighting when you get there. The leveling system is well combined with gameplay. Accessed from a stat screen, the player is able to put points into their melee ability, ranged ability, magic ability, and movement speed whenever they collect at least 100 advancement points. These advancement points are earned on leveling up, or from exploring the dream, a mirror world in which only magical entities may exist. Since the player is a mage, they are able to transition into and out of the dream at will. Most enemies cannot do this, and it trivializes some encounters. That being said, some of the encounters were impossible to complete for my character without abusing dream kiting or causing the enemies to get stuck on terrain. Enemy health numbers can reach excessive heights. As a character that deals between 30 to 70 damage per hit, an enemy with thousands or even tens of thousands of health points is often insurmountable. But overcoming these enemies is part of the charm this game exudes. You don't have to fight fair. You have a button that effectively teleports you to the other side of the room with most of your health back. The pathing problems the enemy have affect the player too. 
running around terrain is only slightly less difficult for the player. An enormous demon monster being constantly pelted with arrows for minutes might look silly, but if the game could do it to the player, it absolutely would. Often, the player will load into an area and two enemies will immediately start running towards them. If the player runs further into the area, suddenly those two enemies gather six or seven friends and chase you down. It's funny every time. And it isn't just ridiculous enemy gauntlets. The main character says some things that eerily remind me of talking to Europeans. She doesn't bother with niceties. She'll often make asides to herself while talking with one person. She simultaneously cares and doesn't care about everything that's happening. I know that the Slovakians weren't really involved with the script of this game, but sometimes it really feels like it, and it feels so familiar. The game's writing also embraces a presentation for the player character. Information that would be common knowledge within the world is glossed over as the player character should already understand the situation. Lesser writers would choose to explain these things, which can often leave characters dissonant to the events that they're supposed to have participated in. It's effective and engrossing. The story isn't about the heretic kingdoms, it just takes place within them. Games Farm have continued the Heretic Kingdom series. Shadows, Heretic Kingdoms, and Shadows Awakening are much closer to the technically excellent streamlined game feel of Diablo 3, but according to Mr. Nagy, they contain just as much heart as the first game. And judging by the excitement Peter says he felt after receiving my email about the game, I would absolutely believe him. Next time, I'd like to go a way forward in time, about a decade or so, for some platforming hijinks. I hope you'll join me.